seller call. I call it a buy call. It's when someone's calling you and wants you to buy their home. Uh, okay. There's no sense trying to negotiate a deal with a lead which does not meet the criteria. Fill out a seller script. Here's the thing. Who in here wants to be interrogated? Anyone. I was in the military intelligence. I can do it. Anyone? The people that call you don't want to be interrogated. You, you need to get this. You're buying houses in Texas. You do not need to interrogate people. Be nice. Treat it like your grandmother or your mother is calling and has a problem and needs help. If you'll follow that little piece of advice, you'll do better than most people. Don't. You need to practice the scripts before you get the calls. Got it? Use the script to fill in the blanks, but don't try to read the script verbatim while you're, t while you're going through everything, and while you're on the phone with the seller, because you're going to sound like a robot. You're going to sound like one of those customer service people that we all hate. So don't interrogate people. If they don't want to tell you how much they owe, you don't have to know. What you're doing is you're having a conversation and you're, looking, you're listening for buzzwords. I had a student riding, riding with me yesterday, and he said, you weren't on the phone that long. I said, ah. They said words like they're thinking about it, and they were considering it, and they're looking into their options. To me, that means they're not motivated. That means they're thinkers. So I'm not really that interested. But if you talk and you have a conversation with people, they'll use words like have to, need to, uh, buzzwords, and I can't handle it anymore, this is just too hard, someone whose mom has passed away over a year ago and they still refer to it as mom's house, I mean, these are things that, it, it's, it's true motivation, and, and, and those are the people that are going to want to work with you, absolute words. Okay, your identity, my identity is simply Tim Heritage, that's the identity I've chosen to go with. I've got a website that's Tim Invest, and it's just just like George's 972 Home Buyer Squeeze page, and it's just a big, it's just a video of me talking and a form, uh, TimInvest.com, and that's it. That's my identity. Uh, I have several different corporate entities, but they're all named after my wife. Uh, so, how are you different? How I'm different? is I've bought and sold over a thousand houses and I've never written a contract that didn't close. But and these I, guys have it, so they well, can't say that. That's how I'm different. So you have to figure out how you're different. You have to say, you know, I really, I love real estate in Rowlett and that's just where I'm focusing, my, my goal. I love making the community better, whatever it is. You have to figure out what your niche is, what, you're, what you bring to the table. Uh, if, if it's that you're focusing in HEB, I mean, You've got to come up with a story, and, and, and I can't write your story for you. It can be, I, I, I've been in corporate America forever, and I finally found this industry that just is, it set my family free, set me free from the 9 to 5, allowed me to be at uh, my son's football games and baseball games. Whatever your story is, you have, to, you have to write it, and then you have to tell it. You have to tell it to everyone that you talk to because it makes you a person. And don't make it some kind of stupid story about, I want to be Donald Trump, and I want to own all of Rowlett. People, they don't like that. I mean, <laughs> you know, you want to just, right, that. They they want to just be a good old boy. You just want to be just, you know, like their grandson. I have so many people that I buy their house, and they say, oh, you just remind me so much of my grandson. You want to just be an approachable, simple person. And then when you leave, then you can call your buddy and be like, <laughs> oh, man, I just bought a house. Brag to someone other than the self. 
Why can you be trusted? You just need to tell them. You know, I, I, I hate these people that run around here. And uh, you know, Brian was with me looking at a house, and if you listen to that audio, you tell people, look, there's people that are going to write a contract on your house, and they have no intention of doing anything with it. They're just trying to sell it. I wholesale too, but, you know, that's why I have to pay. I don't want to tell you something that I can't do. I need to pay this so that I can get the deal done. You just treat them with respect. Uh, you know, let them tell their story. That's very important. Bond with them. Um, we'll, we'll role play real quick. Uh, pick someone. Okay, uh, John. Let's role play. John's a seller. I walk into John's house. John opens the door, and I just let John start talking. He says, what, what do we do? I don't know how this works. It's your house. Show it to me. Is that something? And then you start walking around and you look on the walls of John's house. I've talked to John on the phone. That's why I picked him. I notice as I'm walking around, I see a picture of John's Marine Corps platoon back when he was young. Not quite the spring chicken, right? So I was in the Marine Corps. And if you weren't in the Marine Corps, you've got a cousin, a brother, someone who was in the Army, the Navy, the Marines. If you don't have that bond, look for signs that they like to hunt. If you like to hunt, bond with them on that. If you like basketball, they like you see a sign they like basketball, bond with them on that. It's all about bonding, building a poor personal relationship. Yeah, we're here about the house, but that doesn't matter. Tell me about your time in the Corps. And we're, you're, I would get you to talk about the Marine Corps for 15, 20 minutes as we looked at the house. So the whole time, it's just like two buddies catching up. You're telling me your story all about you and after the core, because you know, here's what happens. Once you get them telling a story about something that's important to them, then they start telling you how that story plays into the house. Then they start telling you about why or where they're looking to go, or what it is, where that pain is, what it is that made them call an investor. Because people aren't stupid. They know they're not getting as much money from you as they would if they went another route. And there's always a reason. The, the old buzz line, yeah, I don't want to mess with realtors. Uh -huh. There's always something more than that. So it's all about letting them tell you your story. And then I keep saying this, shutting your mouth and just letting them talk. The average house, the average buy call that I'm on that I buy the house is over an hour. The average that I don't buy the house is under 15 minutes. Because a lot of times it's the people that I can't bond with that I just can't buy the house. It's all about building a personal relationship at the property face-to-face. -face. Okay, I'm not going to read the script. Do you think, I mean, they've got it in front of them. Um, yeah, it's one of the, it's one of the, your documents, you know, we printed out the buy call script, and so uh, it's in your document library, uh, which talks about, I think, I like the one thing about the discount statement. I kind of like, I, I yeah. like that. I mean, just lay it out there and say, look, uh, you know, I, I want to be really upfront with you and just say, Dave, you know, we are, we're discount buyers. I mean, I'm an investor and we, we buy at a discount. And this week means we're not retail buyers. We, we're not going to pay retail. We'll offer you time and convenience. And, and, and in regards to that, we're looking for a discount. So we can close quickly, pay cash. You won't have to pay, do any repairs. We'll pay all the closing costs. We try to make this as simple as possible, but we're not paying retail for real estate. And if you that doesn't jive with you, you know, let's just part ways as friends. I've got a couple things I tell people on the phone. And these scripts are great because it gives you, they, what they do is they give you the general mentality behind how you need to make the phone call, okay? It, you don't want to try to do this verbatim. You don't need to sit around your house memorizing this. Yeah. What most people will do is they'll call you and say, I don't know how this works. And that's when you say, well, here's my line. Well, let me tell you how it works. My wife and I, this is what we do for a living. I, I, like, I, I buy, fix, and sell houses. I have some rentals. I sell to other investors. I have partners. It's just what we do to make a living. I don't have the big billboards like everybody else, so I can pay you a little bit more sometimes. But just it's pretty simple. I come out, I take a look at the house, and I'll make you an offer. If it works for you, great. If not, I hope to give you some pointers and tell you what you should do. And you just approach it that simple. You don't need, I mean, especially while you're new, you don't need to get into really trying to underwrite the deal before you go get in front of the people and look at the house. You don't need to 
Well, how much do you owe? What kind of loan is it? What's your interest rate? Are you behind? I mean, what happened? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, what happened? Man? Tell me about that. You know, because then you're making them talk that about hurt. people's stuff. Yeah, that, that had to be sorry. Uh, what will happen is a lot of times if you just get them going by just telling them kind of your story, and you say, and you say so why do you want to sell? And they just shut up, and they will just start telling you everything. If they pause, you just say, you know, can you tell me a little bit about the house? Well, like what? I mean, that, that's one of the, when you get the, well, like what, that's the people that you're probably not going to be able to bond with, and you probably just need to go ahead and hurry up and get off the call. But the people that, when you tell me about the house, well, it was my mom's house. It's, we grew up in it. It's a three. I mean, they will go on for thirty minutes, and you just write down the you. And when they start doing that, you start filling in the blanks. And that's <laughs> number one in your document library, which I, I have the by call. If you look at the table of contents, so we're about to start digging into these documents. So get this out and start looking at it. First name, last name. Give you you know. Do you mind if I get your direct number? Is this the best number to reach you at? I'm just curious. How'd you hear about us? Oh, uh, you know, and they usually, I got, you know, like the guy said, I got this letter, or I got this postcard from you. Yeah. You know, what What made you call us? Uh, can I get the address? Tell me a little bit about your house. You know, why do you want to sell? When do you want to sell? Yeah, you ask me, so when you're looking at moving, that's, what, that's the way I say that. When you're looking at moving. Yeah, because what they'll say is, well... I'm thinking I've had I've had people take twenty grand less because they wanted they this one lady I'll never forget it was a house on Montalba over in seven five two two eight in East Dallas and her daughter only child uh, she the lady was divorced and her daughter was getting ready to go to college and it was about August and the mom just finally realized that for the first time in eighteen years her daughter wasn't going to be in her house and she just couldn't stand it and she called me and she said look. I don't need to sell for the money, but I've just decided I can't do it. My daughter's supposed to leave in 10 days, and I want to go with her. I said, well, I can make that happen, but... Uh, well, we are discount but, buyers. Yeah, I mean, but you got to understand, it's not going to be. She said, well, that's okay. And here's the other phrase that I use to help people, sellers understand. Who here has never bought a gallon of milk? Okay, so we're all on the same playing field. Everybody you ever meet will be, just so you know. Tell them, you know, you know when you go to a gallon, go to, you need to go buy a gallon of milk. You can stop at 7-Eleven, and you're probably going to pay about eight bucks for it, or you can drive all the way to Kroger, park in the parking lot full of 200 people, walk all the way to the back of the store because that's where they keep the milk, get the milk, and then go stand in line behind 20 people, probably end up looking at other stuff and buying other stuff while you're there, and at the end of the day, yeah. You're going to leave Kroger with more money in your wallet after that gallon of milk, but it's going to take a whole lot more hassle and time. And so I'm like 7-Eleven. You may not have as much money in your wallet when you're done with me, but it's going to be quick and simple, and I'm right around the corner. And that's the best way you can explain to people that it's time and convenience for a price. The, the, the money they get less is simply the difference in convenience. Right. We're in the convenience business. Yeah, I mean, we're all sudden loan franchisees now. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Right. Preparing for the appointment. Yeah. Pet, pet, pet peeve. And by the way, your appointment checklist, which is going to come after this, but that's number two is what do we need to do in preparation for our appointment? So we've got them on the call. We had them on the call, and we booked time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they're 15 talk about minutes that. away. I mean, we got to, you know. We Don't ever, yeah, I forgot about that. Book the appointment when you got them on the phone. If you have an answering service, teach them to book an appointment. And you give them a, a block of times or something. Because here's the deal. If I want to cancel my appointment with Bob, and he doesn't answer the phone and I get his voicemail, can I cancel the appointment? Yeah, I can. Leave it on his voicemail. Bob, can't make it. Sorry, looked at your house. I'm not interested in it. But he, he booked it automatically, yeah. and then you start doing some due diligence, and you see that it, it backs up to yeah. the it, sewage it, plant. It's in Fair and, Park. Yeah, it's in Fair Park, and you're not, you, you're, you stopped buying there uh, last week or whatever. So I call and just, now, if I don't book the appointment with him, and I look at it, and I am interested in the house, can I book an appointment on his voicemail? No. I have to get him on the phone. Bob's a busy guy. He's in financial troubles, he's got two jobs, he, he drives a truck over the road, whatever. 
You book it when you got them on the phone. You give them two times. You say, Brian, I can meet you Wednesday at 3 or Thursday at 2. Which one's best for you? If, and if, then here's the neat thing. If they can't make those two times, they feel like they've inconvenienced you. And then you're kind of in the driver's seat. Oh, no, I can't. Can you do it Saturday? No. I guess. I'll try. When really you have nothing to do Saturday other than spend money. You know I mean? So you're definitely going to give up whatever you have to go make money. So, yeah, I forgot about that. And you supply the day or the week. I mean, you, you make them pick a, pick a time. So two, time, two, two times and days. Two times on different yeah. days. Yeah. Let me look at my account. Okay, I can do it. Boom, boom, boom. And they can't do it. Then you, they feel obligated. And then if you look at, after you look at the deal, and you're not interested. I mean, and let's just be honest. There's deals that you're going to look at, and you look at the street map on Google, and you look at the aerial view on uh, Bing.com, and you just see it. You're running kind of you're like, I'm not feeling it. It might be a five hundred thousand dollar house, and you feel like you have no business going to it, which is okay. You can leave that voicemail, and you say, "Hey, you know, I'm going to need some help on this. I'll have to get back to you. I need to cancel our appointment on Thursday." And then that's when you get inside the uh, community on our website, and you start looking for other wholesalers that might be actively doing those type of deals, and you see, you start networking. All right, pumps. I highly recommend. The fifth time today that if you don't have access to comps, and now when I say access to comps, I mean a realtor that will let you use their login without you having to sit next to them, then you need to either join the Property Analyzer Pro System through FLS, or go to Investway, or go buy an affiliate membership. But I don't even know. I don't even recommend that because you only have access to solds. You need to have full access so that what you can do is what I do when I go look at a house is I pull 12 months worth of all statuses for that area. Because here's the deal. If you're a tree hugger in here, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be mean about paper. Paper's pretty cheap. Print a ream of it if you have to. Take everything you need with you to that appointment. And as you're driving past your comparables, which is part of property analysis, and we'll talk about that in a second, you drive past the house and you look at it, if it doesn't match, what I do is I just throw that piece of paper on my floorboard and keep driving. Drive past the next comparable, it matches, stick it on the bottom, keep driving. Just, I'll, I'll, I'll throw 20 sheets of paper if I have to. Because the point is, you've already driven there. You're paying $5 a gallon in gas. you got a seller that's ready, a motivated seller that's ready to sell to you. You need to be on, make sure that you're there armed with enough data to make an informed decision, a good offer, and ink the deal. You should already have an idea of what you can pay before you hit the door, and then you're just going to adjust you're, you're going to adjust your price based on the rehab that you see after, and you know, that's kind of the way I do it. Is I already have an idea of what I can pay. The bottom line is, it, after I look at it, I've estimated a certain amount of dollars for the rehab, and let's I might be able to do it for less, and I'm, it might cost more. Uh, you know, print out maps. Uh, a, a very helpful tool in this business is actually a Mapsco here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. That uh, Mapsco's are just you can see the whole neighborhood around, and if you have to go drive into another, you can flip the pages. I love maps goes, uh, but you need to have some sort of map with you so, I mean, so you can actually compare the different comparables to the subject property. Investor activity, you know, that's why I pull all statuses, because when you pull all statuses, you're going to see the foreclosures that have sold in the neighborhood recently, and anybody, can anybody tell me why we care what foreclosures sell for? Because the cost of investment is already down. Who said that? Investors. So, exactly. You want to see what other investors are paying for houses. And you want to buy a little bit below that so that you know you got some clients, right? Uh, major repairs. Yeah, I mean, when you're preparing for the appointment, if the people say, look, we had a sewer leak, we never fixed it, and the foundation's jacked, you probably want to, you know, set up a time where you can take a, a, a specialty contractor with you to the appointment. Because, I mean, the, if, if you don't have the experience required, you're going to show up and it's heaved up six inches in the middle and it's a 12-foot drop over to the side, then why even go? You're not going to be able to make an informed decision. So if they tell you, if they tell you, old Shan bid it and it's 20 grand, you know you need to take a foundation person with you on the appointment. Make sense? Uh, travel time. When you're preparing for the appointment, okay, even if you're doing, you're being a great student and you're marketing to your backyard. That's great, right? 
But what happens is some of the best leads is someone in your backyard that's gotten your piece, and all of a sudden you're a reputable person because they've seen your name three or four times in their mailbox. And they call and say, look, I don't need to sell this house, but my mom just died, and she had a house in Irving, and I want to sell it. I can definitely help you with that. Well, uh, when you're booking that appointment in Irving, if you live in Rowlett or Rockwall, you need to make sure you calculate the drive time. Don't and set, time to drive to comps. Yeah, because here's the thing. Say you work a 9 to 5. And say that 9 to 5 is in Garland. And you book a 6 in Irving. Guess what? You're late. 6.35, 5 o'clock on a weekday, you're late. Unless you hop in the HOV and get a ticket. Then you're probably still late, actually, even if you're in the HOV the way it goes nowadays. So, and then you, or you might get there a little bit late, and then, like George said, you can't drive the comps, you're standing them up, and don't ever be late to someone's home. It's their home. Respect their territory. We'll talk about that. Very important. Okay, arriving at the appointment, be, drive the comparable cells. You pull into the neighborhood, you turn left down 123 Main Street, and you go past the house, and you slow down, and you look. Make sure it's traditional. Is it contemporary? What does the house look like? Does it back up to the super Walmart? You, you look at it, and then you start driving the comparables, and you're doing intelligence analysis. You're doing what I call reconnaissance. You're driving past other houses. If this one backs up to Walmart, the one you're looking at, and then all the other ones are on the golf course under comps, you don't have good comps. You've just got a bunch of wasted paper. Now, take that paper and print on the back side of it next time. But, but if you have one that backs up to Walmart and then you're driving these 12 months worth of comps and you start finding other houses that back up to that super Walmart, you've got to put significant weight on those houses. You've got to really consider that, even if they're active listings, right, George? I mean, because a client, a student of mine called me and had, you know he bought this house and told the guy he needs to talk to me before he buys houses, not afterwards. It would be helpful. Uh, you know, and it backs up to this big, huge industrial center in Richardson. And to get into the neighborhood, you've got to drive underneath power lines that are big enough to power the Chrysler building. I mean, it, it, beautiful house. He did a great job remodeling it. Just, I mean, nothing. And he's benchmarking it against houses that are on a green belt. Like, no, dude, you're about 40 grand over. Lower the price. I'll lose money. You're going to lose money either way. You just need to go ahead and lower the price and get it over with. Uh, be early, five to ten minutes at least in front of the house. Because here's what will happen a lot of times. You're going to pull up to the house, and you're going to see this. They look out. They're looking to see if you're there yet. Especially if it's a little old lady. She's got nothing else to do. She's waiting on you. She made cookies and tea. So you got to be on time. Dress casual. What George and I are wearing today, this is what we wear every day. Sorry, I didn't, I'm not like Ron Dumpin'. I didn't dress up in a three-piece. Okay? It looked nice. It, it looked nice. It looked it nice. Smelled good, too. Right. You had to think about it. <laughs> and even these, these work boots. I wear. I, I get a new pair every year for Father's Day. Because so I wear them every, yeah, next week. I mean, I get a new pair. If you look, you can see the, the sole. I had plastic falling off of them in here yesterday. Nice. I wear them every day. Because when I show up, I look like just another guy. You show up in a in, in a suit. Who do you look like? Uh, a banker. banker. You've heard this one. Yeah. Do people in a bad financial situation like the banker? Uh, he has all the money and won't give it to them. You don't pull up in a Beamer. And if you do, maybe go drive down the dirt road or something. I mean, but if you if you hop out of a new Porsche and you're walking up and you're just you know. I'm Joe Slick. I mean, it's going to be a five-minute appointment. They don't like you're you not, already. You're not going to probably bond too much. They might not even answer relate. the door. Yeah. Which will happen to you. Get ready. They will book an appointment. You will hear them inside. They will not answer the door. Just be ready. Be nice. Uh, you know, this, I, I talk about this a lot. Remember, it's their house. It's their house. Don't block the entrances. Don't pull up in the driveway and block them in. Always park out on the street. Just because it, it, it's, it's a psychology thing. When you block them in, they feel trapped by you. And it, it, it's just it's a psychology thing. When you're walking up to the house, folks, 
look at bumper stickers first on the cars. That's the absolute easiest way to figure out what you're going to talk about. Most of the time, for men in this area, you're going to see a Dallas Cowboys sticker. If they were in the military, you're going to see a military, military insignia. You see one of those two, jackpot, you've got something to talk about the moment they open the door. And if it's football season, I mean, you instant bonding with the football fan because everyone likes to trash talk Jerry Jones. <laughs> Even if they're not an Eagles fan. They don't mind. They like that topic. You can talk about that all day. Uh, one thing is, you know, on uh, being nice and respect their territory, respect their territory, that, that also includes food and drink. Ah, right? yes, yes, yes. Right, Joanne? When you go into the house... And I mean this, and it sounds corny. If they offer you anything, take it. If they have off, unless you're allergic to it and you're going to die, take it. If it's a cookie, unless you're diabetic and it's going to kill you, take it. It could be a $20,000 cookie. Eat the damn cookie. <laughs> Even if it's the worst? If it tastes like a brick, yeah. chew it. <laughs> yes? Do you want dinner? And I thought of you, and I said, that would be great. <laughs> Did you buy the house? Well, uh, she, she doesn't know what she's doing yet, but I was with her for a while. And you've talked to her, and y'all have got a great relationship now. Great. She said, well, I don't know where I'm going to, well, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to call you because I like it. Exactly. And see, and, and then the other thing is, is like if they offer you coffee and say you don't like coffee, ask for something that says, do you have any water? I'm really thirsty. It, that way you're not turning it down, but you're, you're taking advantage of the hospitality. It makes them, especially with the older people in this area, I'm telling you, I mean, you, I have had more coffee at a table in houses I'm looking at. I mean, we, they make second pots, and they want to talk to you. They'll tell you everything about Mr. Johnson, Mr. Smith, and every other neighborhood, and all the renters that move in and out of that house. I mean, you will talk for hours. And you just sit there, leave your phone, don't take, I've mean, got to add this to the slide, okay. don't take your phone in an appointment. Make that appointment the single most important thing in your life while you're there. My wife gets so mad at me that I will not take my phone into an appointment. What if something was wrong with your kid? I said, you got a phone, call 911, it'll be all right. I mean, the thing is, don't take your phone in because it's going to ring, you're going to check it. If you're having a bad day, if you're fighting with your significant other, whatever, if the banker just called and said, you know what, we're calling your note, whatever it is, don't take your phone in. It's going to remind you. You're going to check it. With these smartphones nowadays, I mean, I get more text and Facebook and email and phone call. and I mean, I, this thing is it's, it's crazy. You have it? Yes, sir. How long do you book between appointments? Does some vary by hour? Uh, I typically... Two hour increments. So, like, if I have a one, I won't book anything till three. It, it, that, that's that's my rule of thumb. But that I'm real comfortable with my drive times. Uh, I'll go to a three hour increment. Like, if I have one in Duncanville and then one in Richardson, I'll, I'll put a three hour window in between that one. If if it's gonna straddle lunchtime, I'll sometimes just go to a four hour because it always seems they may be late or you may stay a long time or there may be traffic or. You know, around here they shut down lanes in the middle of the day for no reason. So, I mean, I, you know, two two hours normally, three if it's a long drive time, four if it straddles lunch, just so I can stop and, you know, eat a Wendy's 99 cent cheeseburger. Uh, that's why I got the gut. I know. Okay, uh, walk in the house. Okay. So I get to the house, and I knock on the door, and you open the door, and we're walking around the house, and the first thing you say to me is you say, I know, you're tired, right? <laughs> first thing you say is, I, you know, what, what do you want to see? I say, the house. And you say, well, where do you start? I say, I don't know, it's your house, let's you know, show me the house. Well, they're going to walk you down the hall, and typically in these houses in Texas, the hall starts on the left-hand side almost every time. And you start walking down the hall, don't start just rifling through stuff. Don't start just jerking into the closets and opening stuff up. It's rude. Let them lead and just follow. When you go into the bedroom and you look around, when you walk a bedroom, if there's no bed in the middle of the room, walk diagonally through the room. 
when you walk diagonally, you, you negate the walls and the uh, perimeter. And what happens is when you walk in diagonal, you, you can feel the fall if there's any foundation fall. Have a flashlight with you. Keep it in your back pocket. Don't try to use the flashlight on your little Android phone because then you have broken rule number one about taking your phone into the house. But when you have a flashlight, it allows you to point at things without being rude. So Mr. Sellers walking me into the living room, and we've already walked through the bedrooms and everything, and we walk in, and, Mr. S and, I, and I notice a huge crack up in the wall out of, out of my eye. Instead of going, hey, look at that crack! You just take the flashlight, and you just point and look, and if it's something that they may not know about, you go, hmm. And it, then they'll look with you, and like, what do you see? <laughs> that, that means it's 50 minutes. See, I'm trying to do better. Uh, if it's something that you need to draw their attention to, that's when you go, hmm. But if it's something they've probably already seen, don't bring attention to it. Because most people, if their house is in bad condition, they're feeling bad about it already. So why bring unnecessary pain? Again, it will make them not like you and make them want you to leave. And you don't want them to want you to leave. You want them to want you to buy their house. So you build rapport by walking around. When you're walking around, like I told John, I'm looking at the walls, looking at the family pictures. Now, be careful to listen, because if they say their wife died, don't start bringing up conversation about their wife. Then you're really going to leave. And you might have a shotgun in your ear. So build rapport, mind your manners, like I said. Pay attention as you're walking around. Pay attention to things on the wall. Look for diplomas. Look for uh, honorable discharge certificates. Look for family pictures. Look for things to talk about. Because it's not about money. It's about trying to figure out what you can do to help them. Because if you figure out what you can do to help them, you get the house. Figuring out the why. Yep. Figuring out the why is, is how to be successful in this business. It's not about the money. Although, you know, money is, it, it, you know, it is important. I mean, you money can't make 20 grand less. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you, then you got the field analysis worksheet, which is in your packet. And uh, I mean, you need to determine what they owe at, at, at some point. But I'm telling you, a lot of times people will tell you through the course of a conversation. If you just have a conversation with them, they'll tell you, well, you know, we refinanced a couple years. Oh, really? How much did you pull out? 80. Do you have any of that money left? That's another thing that new people do is, is you guys, you try, to, you try to be the know-it-all, which if you go back to slide two, it tells you what happens to know-it-alls, and you try to, oh, you just refinanced, I can't help you. I've had people bring $75,000 to closing before on a $100,000 house. You know why? They had just refinanced, but they still had the money. They lost their job right after they had refinanced and decided they had to downsize. Dumped the house, moved into an apartment. The point being, don't draw conclusions that you don't know the answer to. Because all you, you know, everybody knows what happens when you assume, right? I think we heard it a couple times on that video we played earlier because of Joe. Yeah. All right, on the field uh, analysis worksheet, I just wanted to go over this, a couple things. It's number three in your, in your packet. Um, talking about, I mean, it talks about the high ticket items, foundation, roof, uh, AC. I mean, that's the big thing. When I'm, when I'm teaching, you know, when you guys are bringing us something, I, it'd be helpful for me, if you're bringing it to me and trying to wholesale it to me or anyone else, is how old are these components? Are these, is the, is the HVAC system five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old? When did you replace the roof? I mean, this type of stuff, you need to, the better you can get at asking this question and determining how much the rehab, the better you're going to get at selling more properties and really fully disclosing to me. And, and part of it's the video, but part of it's just me looking at your field analysis worksheet and saying, okay, foundation work, there is, it has been done. Is there a warranty? Like, I bought that house on, on Tucson from uh, our student, and, you know, I had, it had foundation work, and, and that type, and he went ahead, and the student got that information from the seller so I could take a look at it and make a determination, and uh, he, had, uh, he had another foundation company come out and give him an estimate with measurements or with the diagram, and so 
it was easy for me to go, okay, I got it. I know it's going to cost me six grand for the foundation, minus plumbing leaks, but I, you know, and I made the numbers work. Uh, roofing, paint, just kind of a, a general rule of thumb, but the biggest thing is foundation, roof, HVAC. Let's find out how old or new these components are. Um, what else? I think that's about it. The, only, the other thing is on the second page of the field analysis worksheet, is you've got this diagram here, right? And do you all see what I'm talking about on the second page of the field analysis? It, it looks like a cross, and, and it's not up on the screen, so for the... It's a lot like this row of chairs. Yeah. And what happens is, when you drive down the street, say, this is the subject property. So we're going to put that like that. What you do is, you stand out in front of the subject property, and you look at every one of these as a house, okay? They're not chairs. You look, and I mean, does this house, is it boarded up? Uh, is there a big pit bull in the backyard? Uh, and broken windows, does it have burglar bars, any graffiti, junk cars? If so, this house is really going to hurt the value of this house. And then you do the same process with this one, and then with the one that's straight across the street, and the two next to it. Because the typical houses that I'm going to teach you to target are in... First time home buyer, uh, $100,000 to $140,000 neighborhoods. So you want to target those houses, and who buys those houses? Families. Do families want to live next to pit bulls in the backyard? Most of the time not. Because they have, I mean, who wants to let their little kid run out in the backyard and get eaten? It's just, you know, I mean, it's, it's right. I've got a little hellion too, so I got you. But uh, he'd probably eat the pit bull when he's 19 months old. Uh, but the point is, then as you get farther away and you get over to this house, it doesn't really impact that one that much. But you've got to pay attention. Are there 20 cars in the driveway? I bought houses that I messed up on that I didn't notice that there was one of those, uh, they call them death houses. It's a hospice house that people that don't have insurance go to to die. I bought it, started fixing it, and noticed that there was an ambulance there every couple days. And it didn't have its lights on. It wasn't there, you know, like there was an emergency. It was there to, to pick up. That's it. One-way Yeah, one-way trip. And you weren't on the way to the hospital. It, and that hurt me a lot in the resale of the house. So that little diagram on the FAW is all about analyzing the street, looking for any power lines. Power lines that are dangling, up, like if this is the power line behind the house, Danger, Will Robinson, danger. It just detracts from the value. If you've got this house and then this house and then this is a uh, loop 12, significantly impacts the value of the house. In that case, even if this house, if loop 12 ran here, it significantly impacts the value of the house. So the street scene is just to keep you honest so that you've got to go drive the comps first, but then you need to check out the neighborhood. You need to stand out in front and look around and make sure that is this really a $120,000 neighborhood or is it a neighborhood full of crack houses? And you got to figure that out. Okay, and, and above that are WE issues. Does everybody see that? WE issues. Very busy street. White Commercial elephant. property next door. So what does WE stand for? It's a white elephant. All right, so it tells you subtract 0 to 20%. High tension wires next to the house or behind the house, 0 to 20%. I would say minimum of 10%. Yep. You know, it kind of just depends, but and most of these are at least minimum of 10%. Lower, uh, lower than typical pitched roof for neighborhoods. So if you've got yours is, uh, you know, and you've got the pitched roof on the first page. So all these things savvy investors are going to key in on and I just want you, before you, you haven't seen the property, but you need to start detracting value because of these things. And, you know, if the seller doesn't like it, at the end of the day, I'm sorry. We've got to put us in a, a position where we can, we have a sellable or shoppable or attractive deal. Yep. And you've got to account for these white elephant, poor floor plan. I, I saw one of the students, yeah, Ross. Just go ahead and finish. I got a question. Okay. What uh, Valentin, uh, you know, basically looked at an REO property, and he took a video. He's like, George, here's the comps. I'm like, yep, I like it. 
I'll watch the video, and there's no way to get access to the backyard. He had, there, you basically walk in, and the family room's on the left. Like you said, it was the, the hallway, but it's family room kitchen. And I'm like, and, and then all of a sudden he goes down the hallway to the bedroom. Show me the bed. Then you have to go through the master bedroom to get to the backyard. <laughs> There's not a side yard or anything. It was the strangest floor plan, and I'm like, 20%. And he's like, no, no, George, the comp show. I go, no, I get 20 to 25%. Because the only way is to go through the garage and out, or through the master. I said, well, and that's like uh, it's bedroom add-ons that are done where it's a four bedroom, but you have to go through a bedroom to get to one of the bedrooms. Right. That's a three bedroom with a private den. That's not a four bedroom. Right. So these are the things that the more, and that's why I think it's important that y'all practice. You practice shooting free throws. You practice looking at houses. You practice this, so when it's game time, and, you, and, and I like practicing on REOs. Yep. Walking these properties and evaluating, evaluating these, just like you, we went over to the house in Plano, and, you know, just to practice, to walk through there and run the numbers so when it's, you know, I want to make an offer on this REO, but I also want to be in front of a homeowner and be able to know my bearings and know how to do this on the fly. And we're going to take a break, but George brought up this house in Plano where, that we're standing in, and... George, Brian, and I, had, we were shooting a video there, and we walked through this one room, and George and I were talking about the obvious termite damage, and then we're all back in the living room, and it, it was the first day this house in Plano had come on the market, so there's just person after person just streaming in with their realtor, and this one realtor, they go around the corner, and the, the guy goes, what's that? And he goes, I don't know, but it's definitely not termites. <laughs> and, and, and George and I just looked at each other like, man, he's getting sued. I mean, and the thing is, I say that because we talk about practicing with these REOs. Make sure you take competent advisor with you, you know? So if you don't know, then don't guess. I mean, that's the thing is, part of our, our thing is we've looked at a lot of houses. We can, you know, I can kind of walk through and you can walk through and say, hey, this is 18000 I mean, we can kind of walk through a house and I can gauge it. But that comes through practice and experience, practical experience. Um, and that's, you know, we can convey that to you, but... Uh, you need to practice yourself. And anyway, it's all right, two o'clock, two o'clock, two ten. Yes, yes, Ross. Yes. These costs that you have on this page uh, are, are they what we can expect, or is that like the Tim and George discount that you guys have kind of got with your vendors? Those prices are going to be a little high than what George and I would pay. Okay. Those you should more than be able to expect to get that. Okay. And actually, uh, we have a completely new table that we are almost through with that's based off of current numbers of material cost. It's much more in-depth. That's a great way to figure it out by dollar per square foot, but we're going to be providing... Be ready by five, right? Uh, uh, five. Yeah, five. Yeah, I'll say five. July 1st. I'll say five. July 1st. I'll say five. Okay, five. Yeah. All right, so y'all... Yeah, Fred. Just real quick, do you ever... Do you take into consideration the difference to fix property depending on what city they're in, like for codes and all that, because, you know, McKinney versus Dallas. Right. Yeah, I mean, it all has to do with the finish out. I mean, it doesn't really cost you any more by the location, but it's the finish out that you take into And the permitting and stuff. Permitting yeah, because yeah, I, I, yeah, I did my first deal in Farmer's Branch. You know, I've been Carrollton and all that, and, and I spent four weeks with permits. Four weeks, you know, everything, because we jacked up the foundation, plumbing, and, HVAC, all this stuff has a permit in it, and I, I, it was I, I exaggerate four weeks, but it was two weeks where I'm waiting on city inspectors. So it costs a little bit more, more money for the permits, but not much. It was the time that I wanted to be done in four weeks. And is what type of neighborhood is it? Right, Tim? I mean, doesn't that make a difference? Because you and I will be driving houses, and there's there's a ton of rentals, yeah, right? I mean, you know that there's certain neighborhoods that are more prone for rentals versus rehab and retail. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, definitely. And, and then also when we talk about these uh, white elephant issues, a lot of times a white elephant issue on a good retail neighborhood will actually turn a good retail house into a better rental prospect than it is a retail prospect. And just for terminology, when I say retail, I mean it's a candidate for who you want to wholesale to is going to want to buy, fix, and sell it. That's a retail house. A rental or buy and hold is someone that's going to have the bank line or the capital or the cash to come in, 
acquire the asset, fix up the asset, and then hold it for a long period of time, longer than, you know, to just sell it. So uh, there's a lot of financial information, but it, it, it all goes back to supply and demand. And I like to talk about Walmart because I am a huge fan of Walmart, not because I like to shop there. I'm a huge fan because what an awesome business. I mean, the logistics to run Walmart. They have the single largest logistics system in the world. Their logistics system is actually more complicated, more complex, more automated, and larger than the U.S. militaries. It is amazing. But the thing about Walmart is who here has ever seen a Walmart on a two-lane gravel road? Nobody, right? You know why? You'd have a warehouse full of crap and no one to buy it. So supply and demand translates into real estate. So when we're talking about uh, more rentals, the tenant base, uh, you were just asking me about Pleasant Grove. Pleasant Grove used to be a great retail neighborhood. Why? Subprime loans allow the undocumented workers to get loans. All they had to do was fog a mirror and they could get a loan. Well, now they can't get a loan. So it's actually taken that neighbor of those neighborhoods and turned them into the prospects over there are primarily if you want to own or finance or if you want to rent the house out. Because they still want to live there with their family and friends, but they can't get a loan to buy the house anymore. So, uh, non-transient. The thing about a non-transient neighborhood is, is like a one-bedroom house or one-bedroom condo. I own one at 8110 Skillman, unit 2003. I'll give it to you if you want to take over the HOA payments. It's a piece of junk house. Uh, but it's a transient house because it's one bedroom. People move in, they lease, they get married, they have a kid, they move out. I got a new tenant every six months. But it's, a, it's a very low income neighborhood I mean, because the rent on the condo is only 450 bucks. So uh, people just take off. It's like, I'm going to put a judgment against you. They're like, <laughs> join the crowd. Uh, I mean, it, it just, you know, it, it's a transient neighborhood. Is it safe? A good rental neighborhood's safe because you still people still want to live with their family. I mean, most of the time when people rent a house, it's because they want a yard and, and, and a fence and a dog and all this other stuff. So you got to look at that. Uh, an internal rate of return. An internal rate of return is nothing more than the percent return on your money over a period of time. So if you've invested $100,000 over 10 years, if you make, on average, uh, you know, $1,000 a year, the IRR doesn't measure it on a, on one year. It measures it on the combined the combined average of all ten years. So you really need to learn to run IRR calculations or do what I do and use Microsoft Excel because you can hit equal IRR <laughs> and then pick your values and it'll do it for you. So that's what I like to do. Uh, return on investment. There's a lot of investors out there right now that are getting into the market because they've got cash, they have old uh, stocks and bonds that they've traded in, and they're sitting in sweep accounts, and they just need to do something with the money. They're tired of half a percent, one percent, three percent returns. So you got to learn how, and, and, and there's this neat tool. This is the best tool that's ever come out for real estate investing. You know, everybody write this down. Google. <laughs> right? Google. You want to know how to, how to calculate an ROI? Just Google it. It'll give you the exact formula. IRR, Google it. And it'll tell you, and, and when you do that, it's kind of neat. There's all kinds of websites out there that'll help you do it, and that'll even help you present, come up with neat ways to present these products. Uh, return on investment, that can be cash on cash return. That can be a, a combined yield return, like on the IRR, it's kind of neat. If you, you can model it out in Excel, and it tells you exactly what numbers to put in what block to make it work. It's the original investment and then all their cash flow, and then they sell the house at a projected annual appreciation minus closing cost, tells you what their profit is, and then it just blends all that together and tells them, hey, on the average house that you buy at 70 cents on the dollar, you can make a 15 to 18% IRR. And sophisticated investors, that's what they're looking at. So you, you need to spend the time on Google to learn how to calculate these complex returns because the better you can market your deal, the more sophisticated, the more money you'll make on the wholesale. Yeah, another website is Real Yields, 
realyields.com. Real yields is basically you plug in the numbers and it gives complex charts and graphs and IRR and cap rates and ROI and all that. All you got to do is just plug in the numbers. Um, you know, I'm talking to the, the owner there to try to do something with us, but bottom line is it's, it's a pretty fancy. Uh, you can get a free trial, but uh, I think it's like for a week or two. Uh, realyields.com, it, it, it'll do flips and it'll do uh, buy and hold, and it also does uh, lease options, which, you know, you just choose your tab on what you want to do, but real yields. Uh, is it a, more of a retail flip, actives versus solds, low days on market, clean and neat, uh, no wees, again, those are white elephants, uh, return, percent return, profit, and compounded. What do you mean by compounded, Tim? Uh, you know, the compounded return is a, a neat way to show someone that if, if uh, Nancy comes to me and she, she wants to buy houses, and she says, you know, I hear you hold, so I'd like to buy some houses. Well, what Nancy will do is she'll tell me that, you know, she has $100,000 to invest. But you can model it out, what Nancy can make if she takes that 100 invests it in the house, buys it, fixes, and sells it in four months, and then does it two more times in the year. So she does cycles that money actually three times. Well, then you compound all those returns, and the number is huge. Because if you make 20% on your money once, your APR is actually like 120%. So it's, it's all about sales. And if you meet someone at the country club, you meet someone at, uh, at the Roddy Roundup, there's people that show up every month that are, are new. They're just thinking about buying rentals. I mean, I mean, you meet people over there, if you just talk to them, they've got hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're looking for money. And if you can... Looking for deals. Looking for deals. And, and, yeah, right. uh, and if you can learn to package it and present it intelligently, what will happen is you'll make the decision for them. And the nice thing is as long as you're honest and you don't inflate values and deflate repairs and they meet their expectations, they buy more and more and more from you, and then they tell their friends and their friends call you up. I've got buddies of buddies that call me and, Hey, me and my buddy, we just all put $100,000 into this partnership. We want to buy six or seven rent houses. And they'll come to you. Once you start doing it, you get the word out. They'll come to you. And then you become an order taker. And it's cool because you figure out how they're going to run their numbers. You talk to them. You go meet them at a couple REOs. REOs are the best training ground for anything. Meet a new investor at an REO and figure out how they run their numbers. Practice with them. Because REO, what do you mean? All right, real estate organizations? No, an REO property, property or, or real estate only. Oh, okay, yeah. gotcha. Oh, at REO. Yeah, okay. meet them at an REO. That way, yeah, yeah, yeah. see what they're doing and see what they want, and then you just become an order taker. You just go out and find them deals. Right. And, uh, you know, I won't, I, my buddies that come to me every now and then, my wife's like, well, let's just sell them something off MLS. I'm like, oh, heck no. They want to buy a 3 1 in Garland. I'm just going to double up my mail there. I'm going to go buy us a couple houses and make five to 10 grand a pop. and. They're great. They're getting them less than MLS, and I'm making a whole lot more than a three percent commission on thirty thousand dollars, but nine hundred bucks, and then the broker gets a chunk. Right. Uh, so yeah, you can compound the rate of return, and it looks really neat. And, and uh, it's all about sales. I mean, you got to learn how to package it. And we're going to talk about your pop in, in a second. All right. Uh oh. Yeah. The what SOS. Off? The SOS, which is the Smart Offer Sheet. So basically, what I want you and that's this is in your um, in your document library. I don't have one uh, anymore, but basically, I don't know if I have the same thing up here that I have in your workbook. Can y'all tell me if it's three five five? No, I think I don't. I switched it up. I think it was eighteen twenty one Tucson. Correct. Yeah, eighteen twenty one Tucson. Oh, it is the same. Yeah. Okay. Good job. Uh, these two are down right there. Huh? It's the same in one place, it's different in another. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so this is in the workbook. Let's, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Well, in the workbook, uh, or excuse me, in the workbook, the training manual, and then you have the document support. So you've got this property, and all I want you to do is figure out the, really, the, the stuff in blue. Can y'all see that? Just check mark. That's what you need to fill in the blanks. So the address, the subdivision, the tax value, because once you put in the tax value, it automatically calculates what the taxes are going to be down below. Then I want you to put in the size of the property. It's 1,900 square feet. Okay? 
and 1,900 square feet comes to, at $12 a square foot, $22,800. So as soon as you put 19, it automatically calculates 12, 13, and $15 per square foot. Now, at a minimum, I think y'all need to go $10 a square foot. Always, anytime someone's going to do a rehab, um, it's going to probably be $10 a square foot. So at a minimum, you, you could, now I can manually put in what's down there and projected. I had a projected sales price of 220000 I had a projected app. Now, it kind of depends on the older it gets, the, the higher I start off. Like a 1980 house, I would probably start off at $12 a square foot. A 1990 house, I would start at $10. So 1990 and older, I would say basically you're probably looking at $12 at without even looking at the house. 1970, probably $14 a square foot. 1960, and then, unless it's been some serious renovations have been done over the past 10 years. So that's just kind of how I evaluate. And I told you, you should already have an idea of what you can pay before you drive the comps and before you walk in the door. So um, I came up by looking at the comps, I came up with 220. But I drove the comps, you know, you're driving the comps to verify if I've got a good number. And I'm going to go up or down based on all the comps and I drive it because I get there early. I looked at this property and said there's no way I can do it for $12 a square foot. All right? Because uh, it, it just needed a lot more. There were some issues. And I don't know if it was foundation or not on this Merrill property. Right? Wasn't this now? You didn't like the light. I didn't like the light. Yeah, I did not. I like... I'm the type of person, he learned that right away, that I, I like a lot of ambient, natural light. And when it's dark, I'm out. And how do I figure out how to get light into this? But bottom line is I started plugging it in, and I came up with $35,000 as mine. Now, that was because I was going to move some walls. The kitchen needed to be totally gutted. Um, we needed to do something in the garage, right? I was going to add, yeah. we're going to add the, the utility room, room yep. the laundry room, um, et cetera. So I, I started adding all that up, and I, it was a 1960 house, wasn't it? Uh -huh. So 1960, we're probably looking at $14 a square foot times 1900, and you can kind of, and then I started layering on what um, I wanted to add, and I came up with 35. Now, down below, buyer's closing cost. We talked about this on Wednesday is, man, you need to put 2500 right, or something like that. Right. For me, I'm the one that was going to buy this, and I know, know that I see what you're saying because, again, I, you know, I'm buying a lot of these deals, and they're just assigning it over to me, and so I think you're right. I, I do spend more than $300 for buying closing costs, so I think you need to put in, what, 1%, 2%? I'm going 2%. Yeah. So... I'll plug in 2% of what? Of the, I, I go purchase price. Of what you're paying, which is, it's going to be hard to gauge, so I would probably say, because that's a moving number, at the end of the day, when you plug in the blue, that, that will tell you what I am willing to pay. Does that make sense? This is what the end investor will pay, and Randy, then you've got to sprinkle in what do you want, or, you know, what's your minimum, and that's where, really where it's in the dark blue, it says prospector wants, and then max price is one thirty seven four seventy five. So basically, we went through the buying cost, which is low. I will I will agree to that because I'm kind of used to buying it and having the seller pay. But then it, you're right, nine out of ten times I pay for all the closing costs. Um, I've got holding costs. These are what are called the soft cost of utilities, maintenance or yard maintenance. HOA, insurance, I plugged in 2% there. Now, I always put in, you know, 3% or 4%. Usually, I'll, I'll put in 4% because I'll pay someone else. Even though I'm a licensed agent, sometimes I'll have someone else listed, but they're going to list it at 4%, not 6 Or I might have that built in for, like, Kathy, my office manager, because she's a licensed agent. Maybe she... She, she, I, I build in a little bit so I can give her something because she's handling that. But I say one of the reasons I got my license was not to show for people around. What it was to save when you sell, when you buy, fix, and sell 20 houses a year. 
you know, that adds up when you list it yourself. So $8,800, you guys would probably need to change that more to 6% unless you find somebody that will do it for less. Four months of real estate taxes, uh, you know, I base it on 2.50 because that's what most county, city, and school districts go by. You know, some are a little bit higher, but some are a little bit lower. 2.5% is good. And then selling costs is 1.25. Um, so you can kind of, you know, for the title policy that I'm going to have to pay for after I re rehab it, and home warranty and escrow fees, 1.25%. And then here's where you plug in, what do you think the in end investor, you know, Ross, I've told you like 18000 is my minimum. Um, you know, I typically don't buy too many $50,000 houses. They're anywhere from one hundred to 200000 That's kind of my niche. I don't go the 50,000 route. So, you know, I'm looking for, even though 13% is, is a little light, I think you really need to think like an investor and think 15%. 15% is kind of a minimum on, an, on a what? An ROI, return on investment. Even though that's not annualized. No. I mean, I, I'm really making a better, you know, if I do this in four to five months, you know as well as I do that I'm making more than, yeah, if you, if you turn that money twice yeah. in a year. Yeah. But if I could try to, I would probably, you know, I'd try to raise this a little bit to where it's 15. I think most investors, if you can show them that they can make 15% in six months or 13, even this one, I said, you know, at the end of the day, I'd probably do this. You know, and so there was a number that I came up and said I would pay, but, uh, you know, Tim, you had it under contract, or you, you're the one that got it under contract, yeah. and you got it under contract, I think, for less than 137. 133. 133. But at the end of the day, I don't care if he makes, he got it under contract. I was kind of, you know, the numbers before I looked at it, I was willing to pay 142. I didn't want to tell him that. Well, you never made me an offer. I never made you an offer because it didn't have enough light, Tim. Let's not. Let's just move on. All right, I've moved on. Let's move on. I moved on. I closed on the house. Okay. <laughs> Bottom line is, this is what I use. And this is what you guys need to use so you can understand how the end investor thinks. And we're going to upload. All of you have access to the Flip That Contract portal. And we're going to upload this in an Excel format so you can actually download it and you can use it. Uh, right. And I, I highly recommend that, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll have some emails and stuff about it, and, but I mean, I highly recommend that these numbers here that looks, these are guidelines. You need to understand your buyer and, and who your client is, because if you're talking to someone that's getting hard money, yeah, that goes out the window. Yeah. Because they're, if they're getting hard money, their purchase closing costs are going to be closer to 6% of the total project cost because the hard money lender is going to charge them four points on the purchase price plus the rehab. So you, you've got, that's where there's no way, there's no magic pill, okay? Yeah. There's no way I can sit here and tell you, if you model in 5%, you're good. There's no way, because right. depending on your borrower, depending on the lender, uh, you know, somebody might have a dad like George does that will just give him money for free. So, you know, then you want to use then you want to use the $300 number, right? But if it's someone like uh, Brian that's going to get a hard money loan, you got to up that. And you just got that way because the whole thing is is when you send someone a piece of marketing collateral on a house, you want them to take it seriously. And if you start throwing out BS numbers, yeah, they're not going to open your email anymore. Yeah. All right. Proof of funds. Okay. Remind the owner, right? Uh, this is fun because this is about the only thing I teach that's a bit of skirting the truth on the side towards not the truth. Okay. Now, I have proof of funds. I have a cash bank statement and I have a letter from my lender. Depend, I'm not going to even get into it. I'm just going to go ahead and blanket assume that no one in here could qualify for a real loan. Okay, And I know that's not the case, actually. I know several could probably qualify for more than me. So the point is, no matter what your financial situation, you can get a proof of funds. Okay, 
whether it's from one of these two hard money guys that were sitting here earlier, whether it's just a copy of your bank statement, whether it's a copy of your retirement statement, although I advise you not to use that, um, or if it's from a bank that will give you a letter of guarantee. Whatever it is, one of the first things you do as you set up your entity is to get a copy of this and to put it in your, in your, in your truck or car or whatever you have because... Part of what you're going to do when you present your offer is present that with your offer and let them show them that you got the money. And they don't make the decision on the spot, you're going to tell them. Now, Joanne, be careful. There's a lot of people out there that will buy your house and they can't get the money to close on it. will make you an offer. Yeah. They'll make you an offer, but they can't get the money to close on it and they have no intention of even doing right by you. They're just going to drop you into grease. So make sure they have proof of funds. Here's mine, but just make sure. Yeah. Just make sure. And what you're doing is you're crossing this boundary. And that boundary is you're not just looking out for yourself anymore. You're acknowledging they might settle someone else, but hey, just in case you do, protect yourself. Because we've gotten along good for the last hour or two, and I want to protect you. And what happens is, they call you back and say, if I do do something, I'm going to call you because I feel more comfortable with you. Because, and, and be genuine about it. I really do try to help them because I tell you what, I hate it. It happens to me almost every month. There's a guy out of Fort Worth, I'm not going to say his name, John, uh, that he sends letters to the Dallas probate list. And he writes BS contracts. And he has no intention of closing whatsoever. And he goes out and he'll pay 5 to 10% more than me. And I see it on his email list. I know what he's doing. And if he can't close, he just fills the cellar full of a bunch of lies and terminates the contract the day of closing. Not a week before. Doesn't give them a heads up. Just completely messes them over. And, you know, one day he'll get his. Not from me or anybody. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it'll catch up with him. Because these people, they make plans based off of what you promise them. They try to wholesale that they can't. They don't care about their name and reputation. They just move on. They're trying to find someone who has the money. And if they can't, because the deal, they, they pay too much, then they pull the parachute and say, oh, well, because they didn't put up earnest money, non-refundable earnest money, they talk the seller in. They, they, I think they bait them into, I'm paying more. I'm, I'm willing to give you $5,000 more. They pull the wool over their eyes with the money yeah. and not with the uh, realistic. And, and then what happens, here, here's the point I'm getting to. Then what happens is Mary Jane calls me and says, hey, I had sold it for 50 They didn't close. Can you give me 50 and I'll sell it to you? And then you have to go out there and meet them, and they've already turned off the utilities. They've already moved out of the house. They're messed over. And then you have to reset their expectations. It's like, look, Joanne, I know he said he'd give you 50 but did you get 50 you didn't because he paid you too much. He, yeah, he was and, offering and, you yeah, too much. Yeah, he offered you too much, and then he couldn't get anyone else to fund it for him. That's why you didn't get the 50 that you're saying he gave you. He didn't give it to you. He lied. And a lot of times people can't get past that. They'll end up, they, they, they withdraw from the entire process, and then they end up listing it with a realtor. But uh, so proof of funds is a big thing, and then educating the customers. Uh, it, it will actually get them to want to work with you because you're actually giving them good information and good advice, because it is good advice. 